So good morning, everybody. This is the uh, cycle of seminars by the Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalucía. And today we will have the talk by Dr. Sabiasachi Goswami from uh, CISA Trieste in Italy. He will talk about on the effects of the initial Mach function on galactic chemical enrichment, the role of pair instability supernova. So CISA is uh, the Scuola Internazionale Superiore di Studi Avanzati, which is the International School of Advanced Study. And uh, Sabi is there uh, doing the, he finished the PhD, the PhD and now he is a, a postdoc. Uh, Sabiasachi Goswami uh, studied physics in, in India, in Delhi, in the University of Delhi, and he finished uh, the degree in 2014. Then he moved to uh, Edinburgh at UK, and he made a master degree there uh, with a dissertation called Models of uh, Galaxy Formation. He finished in 2016. And after that, at uh, CISA, uh, he made the PhD called On the Effects of the Initial Max Function on Galactic Chemical Enrichment, the Role of the Pair of Instability Supernova, which is the title of this talk today. And from January this year, he's postdoc there in, in, in CISA at Trieste. And so welcome, uh, Sabi, to this uh, cycle of seminar. And um, please, the floor is yours. At the end, we will have a session of question and answers. Thank you, thank you, Rene. Thank you, Joseph, for giving me the, the opportunity. And thank you for the very detailed introduction. Uh, so I will be uh, uh, talking about the work, uh, part of the work that I did during my uh, PhD. Uh, and it's on uh, how the initial mass function has its effects on the, the chemical evolution of galaxies. And in uh, especially we looked at uh, the, the, the massive stars, very massive stars, and how these stars uh, have their contribution on the galactic chemical enrichment. So let's start with basics. So what is galactic chemical evolution? So it's basically the study of how elements uh, were formed and distributed in the interstellar medium. Uh, as you all know that during the Big Bang, only light elements were formed and the rest of the elements were formed inside the, the stars. Uh, so the first generation of stars were supposedly uh, metal free or metal poor, let's say. And so when they die, they enriched the ISM and the next generation of stars uh, were formed through this enriched gas. And this process goes on uh, till now. Uh, so what these chemical evolution models helps us is to understand the early universe and uh, the various star forming histories of uh, the different components of our own galaxy or other galaxies. Uh, so we, what, we, what we do is we use a very simple chemical evolution code. Uh, uh, um, so uh, we use a very simple chemical evolution code and it, it basically has these three terms. So the first term on the right is uh, the amount of gas uh, going into star formation, where psi t is the, the star formation rate, and xi is the mass fraction. The second term on the right is the, is the term uh, which deals with the stellar yields, is the amount of gas uh, going into feedback when the stars die. And the term ri term here, it basically uh, deals with the stellar yields, which we are going to uh, discuss a lot in the in the in the uh, future slides. And the last term here on the right is the amount of gas in falling in the forming galaxy. And we consider it as to be an exponential law, where tau inf is the infall time scale. This is also a very important parameter that we will be discussing a lot. Uh, what are the ingredients of this uh, of this code? Uh, so the first important ingredient is the self formation rate. We assume it to be a schematic type one, where nu here is the efficiency and k is the exponent. Plus we have a possibility to add a burst of star formation using this FT term. It's an analytical term. And uh, if you want to add a burst of star formation, it can be used. But however, for this work, just to keep things simple, we have not used this FT term. So the star formation rate law is just uh, the, the first term. The second important ingredient are the stellar yields. 
what is it it's the amount of newly formed elements uh, ejected by stars when they die and it can be formulated in the following manner where yj newly is the newly ejector and uh, the the total ejector is given as the ejector coming from the supernovae plus we also consider uh, stellar winds and m initial is the uh, the initial mass the mass of the remnant and the initial uh, uh, metallicity uh, so what this code uh, code asks us to do is to provide these yields in a certain format and uh, so in it is given in the following uh, format you can see the table here so in the first uh, column you have the various masses that you whatever you want to have and uh, on the the corresponding uh, columns you have the various metallicities what uh, you will be dealing with so uh, i'll just put m up here but it could be on your choice on how long uh, how um, how massive stars you uh, you want to use in the in the code on a broader scale uh, stars uh, with masses less than eight solar masses, uh, we consider them AGB yields. Uh, and uh, from above eight to 350 solar masses, we can consider them as massive or very massive star yields. Another important ingredient is the initial mass function. So it is the distribution of the stellar masses at their birth. Uh, generally, it is defined as a power law where uh, X here is the slope of the IMF. And for example, if you take a Salpeter IMF, then X is 1.35. Now, in most of the studies that uh, that happens, this uh, the limit of the IMF, uh, the range, is generally considered from 0.1 to 100 solar masses. However, uh, there are a lot of evidences coming up that this upper mass of 100 solar masses could well be extended to very massive objects. By very massive objects, I mean uh, stars with masses 100 to 300 uh, solar masses. Uh, so the first part of the talk is uh, related to the stellar yields. Uh, so as I discussed, that we will be fo focusing on this part uh, of stellar yields. So what we basically do is uh, first we divide these two, uh, as I said, uh, according to the masses. Now we take different uh, AGB yields and massive star yields from the literature, uh, and we also compute. Uh, yields for very massive stars uh, for the first time till 350 solar masses. So let's go through them one by one. For AGB yields, uh, we take three different yield sets from the literature and uh, the, the masses are uh, roughly till six solar masses. And uh, we take it for the following metallicity. So if we take it from for Marigo, uh, there's a group in Padova, uh, one from uh, Ritter et al. 2018 and uh, Caracas. Uh, Caracas is uh, probably the most uh, used uh, AGB yields uh, that exist today. Uh, what do these AGB yields produce? So they produce uh, a lot of carbon, nitrogen, sodium, and so on. For the massive star yields, we use two different uh, yield sets in, uh, from the literature. The first one is taken from uh, Limonji et al. So they provide yields with, where they take into account uh, rotation. So, and they provide the rotational yields for three different velocities, for zero, for 150 kilometer per second, and for 300. However, the, the upper mass uh, of these yields are till 120 solar masses. And they provide the yields for the following four uh, metallicities. The second one is uh, for uh, Ritter yields, uh, however, they just produce, uh, they, they provide the yield still 25 solar masses. So as you can see, the, the, the upper mass is very, very low. And we will see the implications of this as we go on. Uh, and the last one is the, uh, the yields that we have uh, computed in this work, where we not only provide yields till 120 solar masses, but we also uh, extend, including the later evolutionary stages of uh, massive stars, such as pair instability or pulsational pair instability and so on. And uh, so it extends till 350 solar masses. And we compute the yield sets for these four uh, metallicities. So going from very low to solar metallicity kind of. Uh, these alpha elements are um, produce uh, mainly alpha elements, oxygen, neon, magnesium, and so on. Uh, now I don't have uh, the time to go into detail of the ejecta calculation. However, uh, I will give you a very uh, broad overview of how we do it. 
so as I said, the total ejecta, uh, we consider it as uh, the summation of this, the ejecta coming from the supernova plus the ejecta coming from the winds. Uh, the final fate of the stars uh, depends on the initial mass and the initial metallicity. So what we do is we use the mass of the carbon oxygen core and the helium cores of uh, the parsec tracks. Parsec is a stellar evolution code to link uh, with the already existing uh, explosive models in the literature. And doing so, we calculate the yields for a large number of elements, including isotopes, and for the different metallicities that I uh, showed you earlier. Uh, the point to emphasize is, again, that this includes uh, the pair production supernova for the first time. Uh, it has been uh, done for zero metallicity stars, but uh, for, the, for other metallicities, this, this has been done for the, for the first time. Uh, so what we do is uh, we basically create four different categories of uh, how the stars uh, die. And it basically depends on the mass and the metallicity. So in, in the figure below, you see uh, on the x-axis, there is the initial mass. And on the y-axis, there is the initial metallicity. So the first uh, category is uh, where there is an explosion ejecta coming from the electron capture supernova. So this only happens at eight or nine solar masses uh, and uh, for all the metallicities that we have. Going on, then from 11 solar masses, we go into uh, the regime of core collapse supernova. Now, the core collapse supernova can be a successful supernova, as you can see in the yellow uh, background here, or it could be a failed supernova where you see the red dots here. So the failed supernova directly glows into a black hole and there is basically no ejecta. The ejecta coming is only from uh, the stellar winds. As we go higher in the mass range uh, and for lower metallicities, we see we start to see uh, these stages of pulsational pair and pair instability supernova. Uh, pulsational pair is shown in uh, the red dot with a black square and pair instability is shown in the yellow dot. As you can see, it's very. it happens only at lower metallicities. And for example, at a high metallicity of 0.02, you cannot see these two, uh, these two stages uh, occurring. Uh, what is it? Uh, so uh, very massive stars uh, that develop a final helium core mass between 32 and 64 are expected to enter the pulsational pair instability. And if the mass range is between 64 and 135 solar masses, then it leads to a pair instability supernova. Now, one of the basic differences between these two kinds of supernova is that for the case of pair instability supernova, the entire star is uh, disrupted and there is no uh, remnant left. Uh, whereas in the case of pulsational pair uh, instability, generally uh, there is a remnant which is left and it doesn't, uh, get disrupted in one single pulse. What happens is uh, due to uh, the, the uh, at the core, the, the, the photon pressure uh, balances this inward pull of gravity. Uh, now at high temperatures, what happens is these photons form a pair of particles, uh, generally electron positron. So when they form this particle, this pressure uh, decreases and the gravity wins over. And when it goes on and on uh, in a single pulse, then it goes uh, onto its core and the star is uh, disrupted uh, totally. Uh, going back, uh, the last uh, category is uh, where very massive stars directly collapse uh, to black holes, uh, shown by the DBH category here with black dots. So you can see only, uh, this only in low metallicity, uh, low, uh, low metallicity cases uh, that even for uh, 0.01, you don't see the, this kind of thing uh, happening. Uh, this is uh, just to show you what we do is we compare our yields with the other uh, authors that I described earlier. So our primary uh, yield set is this MTW, uh, is uh, Marigo, uh, the AGB yields, and uh, the massive star is from this work. So if you see uh, this plot and PJ here is uh, the, the initial, uh, the, the ejecta divided by the initial mass. Uh, so if you see here, if you follow this yellow line of our MTW model, uh, you see that compared to the other models of uh, Caracas and uh, Limonji, uh, 
it uh, it matches pretty well with the other uh, other uh, existing uh, explosion models uh, this is for the case of oxygen you can appreciate here uh, the effect of rotation so i show you here the the rotational velocity of 0 150 and 300 in cyan red and uh, black respectively so if you see that if the rotational velocity increases this production of, in this case for oxygen is also increasing with the high rotational velocity we'll come back to this uh, this thing uh, later uh, so now we have uh, the yields uh, we have uh, the cold so what we want to do is to test these new yields against the Milky Way thin and thick disk uh, observations. So we use the Kiwo code um, uh, made uh, written by one of my supervisors, Silva uh, at all. Uh, so what we do is we create five different ejecta sets combining AGB and massive stories. So for example, in the first two cases, MTW and KTW, just the AGB yields are different whereas the massive star yields are uh, the same. Just to see that what effect uh, the, these AGB yields have on, uh, on the elements that we will be discussing uh, in this work. Then, for example, in the last case, you have the massive star yields from uh, uh, rotation uh, to see how much rotation affects the, the, the chemical evolution of the Milky Way. Uh, what are the main parameters that uh, we have uh, explored? Uh, so these are the following four, uh, as I said, uh, the star formation rate, so the nu here and k here are the efficiency, uh, the star formation rate efficiency and the exponent of uh, star formation rate. Then uh, there is a term called ASNI, which is the supernova 1A normalization. So what it, this term deals with is uh, that out of all the binaries that exist, how much of those binaries will actually go through uh, type 1A supernova? to take these uh, contributions into account. And uh, the last one is the, the tau infall, uh, I, I told you earlier, is the infall time scale. Uh, the output of the Kiwo code gives us uh, the, the abundance of uh, various elements that we have provided in the yield tables. Uh, it gives us the, the, the star formation rate, the supernova rates, and so on. And generally, these uh, the output should be able to reproduce the observed constraints and uh, the, the elemental abundance uh, ratios is one of the very important constraints in chemical evolution uh, studies, where X uh, can be any element and it is formulated in this way, where it is uh, compared with respect to the sun, and this is for the star instead. Uh, for uh, the, the data that we use in this work is uh, taken from Bensby et al, 2014. So I show you four different uh, alpha elements here. And the, the magenta dots that you see here, if you just focus on oxygen for a second, uh, the magenta dots that you see here is are uh, the thick disk stars. And uh, uh, the, the, the blue uh, dots here are the thin disk stars. How do we distinguish it? Uh, so using this value of TD over D, which is uh, the ratio between the thick disk probability to the thin disk probability. Uh, so if this value is greater than two, we consider it as a thick uh, disk star. Uh, if this value is less than 0.5, we consider it as a thin disk star. Uh, so you can see that the, the, in most of these elements that the thin disk, uh, the, the thick disk stars shown in magenta are uh, in general above the, 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 the thin disk stars. So they have a high alpha enhancement compared to the uh, thin disk. Uh, now, our model, uh, since there, uh, as I showed you, there are a lot of uh, free parameters in the in the code. So the one of the way to uh, to deal with it, uh, to make the, the, the model more robust is to uh, compare it to as many observational constraints as you could. And for that, we took uh, these constraints into account. So it, it, these are the metallicity distribution function, the star formation rate, uh, the supernova rates, uh, the gas fraction and the metallicity of the sun. Now there have been previous studies which has uh, which has looked at the same problem of uh, of uh, looking at the thin and thick disk. So, for example, I show you uh, a couple of studies. Uh, one is from Mikali et al. They used a three infall model. So, like in this figure, uh, the red part is the infall dealing with the halo. 
then the second infall deals with the, the thick disc and the third infall finally deals with the thin disc. Uh, so the, 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 the idea to show these things to you is to get to know about these two parameters because these two parameters are important constraints uh, for the thick and thin disc. So for example, for the thin disc case, they found out that the star formation efficiency of NU is, uh, should be a minimum of one uh, per giga year, whereas the infall time scale is six giga year. But if you look at the thick disk, this infall time scale drops, um, drops a lot uh, from six giga year to 1.25 giga year, and the star formation efficiency is, uh, is almost 10 times. Uh, another, another study done by Grissoni et al, they used a first a two infall model where uh, they, they, they modeled the, the thick disk in the, the thick disk is shown in the red dots here in the first infall. And then they look at the, the thin disk in the second infall. However, they did a parallel model where uh, they, 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 they look at these um, uh, populations differently. So they first uh, uh, in in one uh, model, they just model the the thick disk, whereas in another model they they model the thin disk. So we um, we do the same parallel approach in our study, and for the parallel approach, they found the thin disk uh, has a star formation efficiency of one, as I showed you earlier, and the infall time scale of seven, which is very similar to six in the previous uh, previous uh, case of Mikali, whereas for the thick disk. Uh, the infall time scale is much shorter than the last uh, last one, uh, whereas the star formation efficiency is uh, double. So keeping these parameter choices in mind for the thin and thick disk, uh, I show you the, the 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 results of the observational constraints for the case of thin disk uh, case. And uh, here there are the star formation rate, uh, the gas fraction, uh, the supernova two, supernova one A rates. Uh, the metallicity of the sun and the metallicity distribution function. So here, here there are five different cases of the yield sets that I showed. Uh, and if you see that most of uh, these constraints are pretty well reproduced. Now, if you go to, uh, if we see uh, in more detail, the parameter choices, if you look at the MTW model, the no here is 0 0.8, whereas in the previous studies, it was one. Uh, and the infall time scale is six, which is very compatible with the previous studies. For the IMF, for the thin disk case, we use a canonical IMF of upper mass of 120 and a slope of 1.5. Uh, so for the for the thin disk case, uh, we are able to reproduce the observational constraints and going to the predicted abundances of these uh, elements. Uh, so if you see for ox for the case of oxygen, we took oxygen as a prime uh, prime element. Uh, if you see at the yellow uh, um, yellow line. It, uh, you see that this goes through the, the middle of this blue blue thin disk uh, stars. Uh, for, for the case of magnesium, so in the field of chemical evolution studies, magnesium is uh, has this problem of underproduction. So if you look at this cyan line, which is the yields uh, taking into account the, from uh, Limongi, this is what you get for magnesium. And generally you have to scale it uh, 1.2, 1.4 times to reach the, the, the observed data set. However, for our case, we have uh, been able to solve that. And although it goes through the, the lower limit of thin disk data, this underproduction problem have been, uh, has been solved to a certain extent. Uh, the silicon and calcium are more or less uh, well reproduced. Uh, I'm sure you would be wondering the, about these two green lines, which uh, run uh, much below the, the other models or the observed data set. So these two models are from uh, Ritter. And uh, so after investigating this, uh, this uh, the reason for this low running of these models, we found out that the reason for this is uh, because uh, they have this peculiarly high production of iron in their yields. So what happens is if you have a lot of iron uh, in this ratio, this ratio drops down and this all these models go much below the, the, the observed uh, data set. So that, that's why you see these two models always going below for all the elements, let's say. Uh, now moving on to the, the thick disk, as I showed you that uh, the thick disk has a high alpha enhancement for most of the, the elements shown here. 
they have a different star formation uh, than the thick uh, than the thin disk uh, and generally this thick disk populations are uh, on average older uh, than the thin uh, disk so now what we do is similar to the the the, the last uh, method we followed we use the the parameters similar to the ones in the previous uh, studies but doing so uh, we uh, get a clear ex uh, excess in the in the metallicity distribution function at lower metallicity so what we do is we adopted a slightly lower efficiency of 1.4 instead of 2 uh, and uh, you see that the 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 the, uh, the median value of this metallicity distribution function is pretty well reproduced however at the at lower metallicities there is still uh, uh, an excess at around uh, fe over h uh, minus 1 but it was even more if you use the same parameters as the previous study uh, since our code is a simple one we don't have uh, outflows so we had to use um, uh, galactic wind uh, to expel this residual gas out of the the thick disk uh, thick disk model uh, how uh, this base model does with the so here i just show you the thick uh, disk uh, stars and so this is with a canonical imf of uh, an upper mass of 120 and a slope of 1.5 so although it uh, it goes through the thick disk stars you see that these uh, stars which have a high uh, alpha over fe values are not very well reproduced with this canonical model now till now what how uh, people use to achieve this high alpha over fe is uh, through rotation so as i showed you earlier that if you see the three rotational velocities of 0 150 300 uh, as you increase the velocity the the production of oxygen uh, increases so if you use models which has higher rotational velocities you can increase this high alpha over fe one more point I would like to uh, make you notice is that this uh, yellow uh, production of oxygen as you go above 100 solar masses. So this is from our yields and you since the other authors stop at 120, you don't see any other uh, any other lines here. But uh, this is to show that oxygen is produced uh, a lot from these massive stars above uh, 100 solar masses. Now coming back to rotation. What we do is we create three different uh, models with these three different uh, rotational velocities and see if we are able to reach that high uh, fe values or not so here uh, there are the models with four different velocities the blue is with zero uh, green 150 orange 300 and the shine is with the averaged uh, value so if you see that as the in uh, rotation velocity is increasing you can bracket this hole from the bottom uh, part to the top part of the high alpha uh, high alpha over fe values so thick disk uh, requires uh, higher than average uh, rotational velocity uh, now there have been a lot of evidences of a uh, uh, varying imf uh, romano et al uh, showed that uh, to reproduce the low 416 over 018 abundance ratios uh, they need a top-heavy IMF. On the other hand, Rabkova uh, showed using the integrated uh, IMF theory that uh, when galaxies have a metallicity of less than uh, zero, of FEA over H uh, less than zero, and a star formation rate of greater than one, they should possess a top-heavy IMF. Uh, on the other hand, if the metallicity is greater than zero, the, the IG IMF becomes uh, bottom-heavy. Now, I also showed you in the last slide that this uh, there is a lot of oxygen production uh, coming from these massive stars. So the idea was uh, to see if we increase the upper mass limit of the IMF from 120 and go beyond and explore from 120 to 350, whether taking this contribution of oxygen into account, we can reach this high alpha over FE values, which our base model was not able to, to reach. And these are the, 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 the results. So I show you four different uh, models here. Uh, the first two models have the same uh, a canonical upper mass limit. However, there is a change in uh, slope, 1.7 to 1.5. And uh, in the next two models, we have increased this upper mass limit to 200. And uh, the slopes are very similar. 
So if you see that the, 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 these two canonical models of blue, blue and orange uh, have this feature of lying very, uh, starting from the lower limit of the thick disk stars. However, if you move to these two models with the higher upper mass limit, you see, especially with this red model, that it is able to also reproduce this high alpha, uh, alpha over Fe values. And then it passes through the, the it, these four models brackets the whole uh, thick distance, let's say. Now, the reason why you see that the these two models starts much higher up compared to these two models is because in the last, the red and the blue, uh, the red and the green models, uh, the, the pair instability supernova starts to uh, dominate. And what happens at these lower metallicity is uh, due to this pair instability supernova, you have a lot of ejection of iron. So what it does is this reduces this ratio. If there is a lot of production of iron, this ratio decreases. And that's why you see these models starting much lower than the, the canonical models. Now, when you go towards higher metallicity and around an Fe over H of minus two, what happens is at higher metallicities, stellar uh, wind becomes more uh, important. And so they uh, go through the low mass uh, pair instability supernova. So what happens in this low mass pair instability is there is not, uh, not enough production of iron, but still there is a lot of production of oxygen and magnesium and so on. So that's why you see at, this, at these metallicities, uh, there is this pump because oxygen is produced more as compared to iron. And this ratio increases, and that's why you see this bump uh, here. Looking at the the metallicity distribution function, it is pretty well reproduced, and the excess that we saw in the previous uh, MDF is also resolved uh, using uh, this new model of two hundred and one point four. Uh, if you look to magnesium, it's uh, pretty interesting because first it is pretty well reproduced. Uh, and in chemical evolution studies, to reproduce oxygen and magnesium uh, at the same time, it's uh, it's um, it's rather difficult, I would say. But this is one of the the few times other people have also done that before. But it's uh, it's one of the few times that we are being able to reproduce uh, the magnesium and the oxygen together. Now, uh, if you see that uh, these two models uh, with the canonical IMF and the models with the, uh, M up. Using these uh, models, we are able to uh, explain this last, large dispersion of magnesium data at low metallicities. So if you use a canonical model, you generally start, uh, start uh, from around here. So if you don't take into account the, the, the pair instability supernova, these stars are, uh, are uh, were never being uh, able to reproduce. Uh, however, with increasing the IMF, we are able, so for example, here I just show you for 200, but if we go, for example, to even higher to 350, let's say, so it goes through uh, uh, like here. So you can uh, explain this whole dispersion of MG data at lower metallicity just by changing uh, the, 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 the upper mass limit and the slope of the IMF. So this gives hints that the pair instability supernova could have played uh, an important role in the in the evolution of the halo stars at low metallicities of the Milky Way. Uh, now, since we used only one data set, uh, there could have been uh, issues that since uh, why don't you compare with other uh, data set? So that's why we compared it to two other surveys. One is from Gala survey and the one from Amber. Uh, the amber one is shown in cyan here. They don't provide for oxygen. That's why you don't see uh, the, the amber data here. But the point to note is that our models are also compatible with uh, other uh, data sets available. Uh, so the summary of this part is uh, for the thin disk, uh, we computed uh, the yields uh, and which compare well with other authors. Uh, we have been able to reproduce uh, the uh, the, 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 the thin disk case for oxygen and silicon are pretty well reproduced. However, there is a bit uh, under prediction of uh, magnesium, let's say. Uh, 
for the thin disk case, uh, we don't need to change uh, the IMF or increase the upper mass limit. And the, the, the infall time scales and the star formation efficiencies we got are in agreement with the previous authors. For the thick disk case, I showed you that uh, high rotational velocities is uh, required uh, for the thick disk. However, if you take the IMF into account, this can, mm, so increasing this upper mass limit of the IMF and changing the slope, we can bracket this whole thick disk population. Plus, the advantage is that for the large dispersion of data at the lower uh, metallicity, we can explain that using uh, the ejecta coming from pair instability supernova. Now, the last part of the talk is uh, uh, to see how these uh, pair instability supernovas uh, affect the chemical evolution of uh, extremely metapore galaxies. Uh, so this is uh, uh, to further stronger the argument for these uh, processes and how uh, it, it, it evolves. Uh, so why study these uh, extremely metapore galaxies, otherwise called EMPGs, is uh, because they shed light on the early galaxy universe and the first generation of stars. Uh, the extremely metapore galaxies are defined to have metallicities of log over H of 7.69, whereas uh, for the sun, it's 8.69. So what happened, uh, so Kojima et al, uh, during uh, the first lockdown in Italy, I don't uh, know the time span in uh, Spain, they, they, they put out this um, uh, elemental abundance ratios of local EMPGs and uh, which have the following characteristics. So they have low stellar masses, they have uh, high specific star formation rates. Uh, so specific star formation rate is the star formation rate divided by the stellar mass. And they are pretty young of the order of 50 to 100 uh, mega year. Uh, so these are the observations. Uh, so this, uh, the red stars that you see here are, uh, are the stars taken from this sample of uh, Kojima et al. And the, the orange star here or the yellow star here is taken from a different uh, literature, but which also showed this high uh, value of Fe over O. Uh, which is uh, a very peculiar uh, behavior, let's say. So even though like you see a very large error bar for the case of the red star, since the this orange star is taken from a different study, it gives you a more, uh, it, it makes the argument more stronger that these stars could have uh, such high uh, Fe over O values. So another thing to notice is uh, that these uh, values are almost solar. So this gray uh, lines are the solar Fe over O values. And the blue dots here are uh, stars from uh, our own uh, galaxy. Uh, and the second point to note is that as you increase in the metallicity, these, um, the Fe over O values of these uh, objects, this, uh, they go on decreasing. Uh, now they, they gave uh, three possible scenarios to explain this high Fe over O ratios. The first is through professional dust depletion. Uh, the second is through mix of metal enrichment. And the third is through the contribution of very massive objects beyond 300 solar masses. So let's go through one uh, through them one by one. So the first scenario, they say that since um, the iron is depleted into dust more efficiently than oxygen when you go to higher metallicities, so when you go to higher metallicities, since uh, iron is depleted, this falls down. And that's why you see this uh, lowering trend uh, in the observations. But this doesn't explain the already at the first instance why it should have a high Fe over O. Hence, they reject this, uh, this scenario. For the second case, they, uh, they suggest that uh, the, the gas uh, out of which these uh, galaxies were made of already had uh, like a solar metallicity and a solar Fe O values. So this explains the high Fe over O value of these objects at uh, uh, such high values, but it doesn't, uh, so it doesn't explain uh, that since if it is made from the same uh, solar and uh, solar metallicity gas, you would expect uh, the other elements also to have uh, the solar value. But when they looked at uh, the N over O ratio, they found it was pretty low. 
and thus this statement also is rejected uh, the last uh, scenario is uh, through the contribution of very massive objects beyond 300 solar masses so uh, they say that uh, these objects produce a lot of uh, large amount of iron and that is the reason why you can explain it through this uh, scenario so the aim of this work is uh, since we i showed you the yields we have till 350 solar masses to so the aim was to check if using those yields we can reproduce such high uh, fe over o values just to put things into perspective so here i show you two two models m1 and m2 so m1 is the same model as the for the thin disk that i showed you earlier and m2 is the model for the thick disk that i showed you earlier so the point to show you this is uh, that using canonical models we are much we go much lower than the the, the than the objects 3 and 10 however uh, the thing you notice here is uh, that for the thick disk model which has an m up of 200 this ratio already starts to increase the fe over o ratio so this already gives you uh, a hint in a way uh, further uh, there have been evidences of top heavy imf uh, with uh, the with the metallicity so for example mark satal showed that when you go lower in the metallicity the the, the slope of the imf uh, goes down so the idea was uh, to increase uh, the m up to let's say 300 and to make a top heavy imf to see if we can reach these uh, high uh, alpha uh, high fe over o values so here i show you the model 3 which uses a uh, upper mass limit of 300 and a slope of 0.6 uh, although it is uh, inside the error bars of uh, the object 3 but it's still not uh, able to reach the high values of object 10 and this decreasing uh, trend happens at a uh, at a different metallicity than observed so what we tried to do was uh, since uh, it happens at the wrong metallicity we tried uh, so if a few of these empgs are uh, represent a starburst evolutionary sequence then uh, we assume that this metallicity at which it is going down has to be a specific metallicity and we found that from the comparing it to these observations uh, that's that's how we modified the yields uh, not not the yields itself but at which metallicity should this uh, these processes uh, stop to to reproduce these uh, observations and if i show you the the final results uh, the models m4 and m5 which uh, are able to go through these uh, objects uh, first uh, they are able to reproduce these high fe over o values second they are also able to reproduce this decreasing trend in fe over o uh, when you go towards higher metallicities so these two models m4 and m5 use uh, uh, the first is uh, an m up of 300 and a slope of 0.6 whereas for the case of uh, m5 uh, the upper mass is uh, 350 and uh, the, the 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 slope is the same uh, another important point to notice uh, to 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 discuss here is the ages because i told you at the beginning that uh, these are very young uh, these uh, these objects have very young ages so the squares that you see on the on the lines are uh, the ages of the models at uh, 30 mega year uh, 60 mega year 0.1 giga year 0.3 giga year and 0.6 giga year so there are five uh, squares so if you look at the the canonical models uh, of thick and thin disk the first uh, uh, the, the the first square uh, happens much earlier than these uh, objects uh, are, are 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 shown so and these objects have uh, an age of around uh, of the order of 30 to 50 mega year but if you look at the models m4 and m5 the first square is around this object 6 or so uh, and that's how we are also able to reproduce these uh, ages of these uh, of these uh, galaxies and it's it's a way to constrain to the the, the model let's say uh, how 
are we able to reach such high fe over o values it can be explained uh, using this slide so on the right side i show you uh, on the x axis there is the initial mass and the y axis is the mass of the helium and i show you for four different uh, metallicities on the left hand side i show you the ejecta from heger and wosley for the pair instability supernova for the uh, six different uh, element cases and here the x axis is uh, the mass of the helium so for example if you look at uh, initial mass uh, a star with the mass of 120 solar masses and if we for example let's take a metallicity of 0.001 you see that for the case of 120 the mass of the helium is around 60 or 70 and if you go to iron here 60 or 70 solar masses uh, star doesn't produce any very negligible quantity of iron let's say now if you go to higher masses and change this uh, limit from 120 to 300 you see that the mass of the helium now is uh, helium core is now 120 or 130 solar masses and if you go in this uh, on the iron plot again you see now there is a lot of iron production so going from 120 to 300 this production of iron increases whereas the the the, the production of oxygen decreases when you go uh, from lower to higher masses that's why you see when you go to higher upper mass uh, limits you see this very increase in uh, fe over o, o values what about the the stellar mass and the star formation rate because these have uh, these objects have very particular uh, uh, stellar masses and star formation rates and as you can see that the the three models m3 m4 and m5 uh, can uh, reproduce the averaged uh, let's uh, kind of value of these uh, of these objects uh, in summary uh, a top heavy imf Uh, with a well sampled uh, uh, pair instability supernova ejecta is required to fit this high uh, fe over o values there could be a possible tension with the ig imf uh, theory uh, so they say that low sfr as these objects have uh, implies bottom heavy imf but the possible solution to this could be that these um, the integrated imf theory is not um, is not good enough for these uh, small or uh, starburst dominated galaxies for such galaxies as i showed you max is uh, is better suited uh, in conclusion i uh, i showed you first uh, the new yields that for the first time include uh, the the very massive objects ejecta which include the pair instability supernova then we tested uh, these yields against the thin and thick disk data successfully and uh, the thing we found out was uh, that the also an a, a plus point is that using this method we can explain this dispersion of uh, mg over fe at low metallicities and finally i showed you for the case of empgs the high fe over o values uh, can be only explained uh, with uh, with a top heavy imf Uh, some of the future prospects of of the work are uh, the following so of course with the coming uh, upcoming data sets it, it would improve our uh, understanding a lot of the different populations of the milky way or other uh, galaxies around uh, in this work we just concentrated on the alpha elements but the idea is to extend it to other uh, elements and also possibly to heavy elements uh, the thing that i am working on now is uh, is the third one here that uh, so the idea is to look for such uh, peculiar cases of galaxies as uh, the high fe over o values uh, where uh, you can uh, see empgs showing uh, elemental abundances uh, where these elements are produced predominantly by pisn so we have to look for uh, these objects where you see a uh, strange uh, oxygen value or magnesium value or something silicon abundances and so on which uh, might not be explained till now or could have been explained in a different way and lastly the idea is to use a, a scheme of variable imf for example that could be metallicity dependent uh, for example you have different bins in uh, the metallicity and you can change the imf in each of those bins 
so that's how it can help us to constrain uh, the the imf in uh, in different uh, metallicity regimes uh, and uh, that's it and thank you for your attention and you can ask questions uh, if you have thank you very much dr goswami um now the talk is open for uh, questions uh, anyone who want to ask a question please raise your hand pressing the reaction button and we have one now carolina please yes, thank you i i have the camera off because my internet connection is very no poor <laughs> but thank you very much for the talk um yes since the binarity is now considered an important uh, ingredient in the evolution of massive stars um according to present uh, models for massive stellar evolution uh, are you planning to explore how binarity can affect yields? Uh, that could be a possible, uh, uh, that could be a good idea. I, uh, like, honestly, we have not uh, thought of working on that yet. Okay. But, but, but yes, it could be, uh, because there are a lot of things where, which affect uh, the yields uh, a lot. So there are, uh, this is one of the things. Then there is one more thing uh, which involves uh, the core collapse supernova, for example. So at which uh, mass you stop, uh, you, so as I said, there are successful and failed supernovas. So at which mass you stop also, uh, also change the yields totally. So there are a few things where the yields could change. Um, but yeah, we have not done that yet, but it could be, a, it could be an interesting approach. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Carolina. Uh, we have another question by uh, Pepe Vilches. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Sabi, for this uh, very interesting and very nice talk. We have enjoyed and learned a lot. Yes, one of the questions was that Carol, that's exactly what Carolina asked you before, to mm -hmm. put this trend into binarity in the model. But uh, another point which I think is very interesting, there are many things, but I think that here maybe another point which I think is find it very interesting is whether you have explored other elements uh, like, like uh, sulfur, which are in relation to the IMF, it, it, sulfur is not exactly produced in the same range of masses. Could be this produce a hint for you? Yeah, so for, for, for sulfur, if I remember well, we have not uh, put in the, the paper, but we were, of course, looking at, at some other elements. So for, for example, carbon and sulfur, and mm -hmm. if I remember sodium, they were all pretty well reproduced, but, uh, uh, but we didn't check it with the, for the case of the, 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 the IMF for the thick disk uh, case, let's say, mm -hmm. because in, it depends on the data set that if you have uh, these uh, observations for thick and thin for which uh, all elements so but i think our models are compatible with the with the sulfur data set as well mm -hmm. so that yes was the idea was whether whether sulfur in relation to the very very massive stars and the other and the mm -hmm. more canonical can can say something more than uh, let's say for instance neon or something like that which are more alpha. yeah because uh, so uh, like if you see here there is mm -hmm. uh, a sulfur which is being produced by these objects uh -huh. so uh, and this is not true for all the elements uh, but there are some elements which are uh, produced and i think it could be very uh, like I, I am planning to do that in mm -hmm. the in the future that look at other um, elements let's say as you said sulfur but also uh, aluminium and aluminium. Mm -hmm. and i think sodium or maybe i, I don't remember properly but there are uh, observations of uh, for example these four uh, objects which are highly uh, high uh, alpha over o values but they also show sometimes high sulfur or high sodium so this could uh, give us a hint that also sulfur is uh, could be reproduced as the same way as uh, as we 
uh, reproduce the the alpha elements so that is a very uh, very uh, important uh, thing to to investigate according to me yes but i i, I think it could be uh, it, it it could have important uh, implications yes uh, another interesting point is uh, oh, sorry it's in relation to the uh, possible hints or possible you know footprints of the presence of very massive stars in extremely metapur galaxies that which are we are very interested on in that actually mm -hmm. Uh, because Carolina has published papers on the very massive stars in, in very nearby local, mm -hmm. local galaxies with very poor uh, metal content. Uh, what do you think that another extension could be on top of the uh, nucleosynthetic aspects? So the abundance of iron over oxygen, which I find very interesting. So in the presence of this very massive star should be noticed uh, immediately in the ionization of helium to high levels of helium helium 2 because the spectrum of the set which mm -hmm. is consistently from this the presence of this star should be more very i mean should be very very hard so it will be very very hot stars so mm -hmm. that should be a possibility how you i mean uh consider the possibility to use a consistent model producing the output of the of uh, ionizing photons from these very massive stars in your model so it's a how much of the helium, uh, the helium two would be there when my my progenitor of uh, pain stability supernova is there? Yeah, but uh, I, 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 you can do that. But yeah, we have uh, we have not uh, looked at the 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 the, the, the ionizing uh, spectra, for example, of the elements. Let's say. But uh, yes, uh, for sure, I'm I'm pretty much uh, convinced uh, because also I, as I'm working on different data sets. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, here. I show you for the case of oxygen, but also for the case of uh, uh, magnesium, uh, mm -hmm. which I'm working on right now. There is there are data sets uh, showing uh, Mg over Fe values around here. Let's say ah, okay. minus two point nine and uh, ranging from minus zero point two to minus one. And those values, uh, I am for now. It's not uh, finalized, but the pre preliminary results show that we, from using these yield sets, from the uh, inclusion of uh, very massive objects, we can go to the those uh, low levels of uh, Mg over Fe. And since uh, we are not looking, I have not looked into other elements, but that is what I am doing. I think uh, it it. It definitely uh, will show some uh, the, the 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 contribution of these uh, massive stars. Oh, they are present. They are present. Uh, for me, yes. <laughs> it's, it's not because I have done so, but the more okay, I okay. explore, I see that the 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 way to explain that uh, could be could be this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Pepe. Okay, Carolina. Yes. <laughs> Hi again. Um, so as Pepe mentioned, so we have been working on these uh, nearby extremely metapool galaxies, and uh, we have found in several objects that we need to invoke uh, metal-free ionizing stars to reproduce um, the high ionization lines that we, we found in these galaxies. So um, in this sense, um, are you considering to explore the yields from uh, metal-free uh, models? Yes, yes. So that is uh, one of the things we were discussing because as I showed you, we have yields. The lowest one we have now is uh, 10 to the uh, minus 4. But uh, as you go towards the lower uh, metal city regions and with the more upcoming data, we have to kind of... Uh, the idea is to have one more uh, yield set for an even lower uh, metallicity range, so it could. I think for the metal-free case, we uh, there is already yield sets which exist, but uh, the idea is to have uh, a kind of uh, for from metal-free to the lowest metallicity, we have one more uh, metallicity in between them to okay. to explore uh, explore. Okay. Yeah, so okay. this, this will be this will be very interesting for us yes. for the objects that we are studying. Yeah, exactly. Because like, uh, as I showed you earlier, that uh, this metallicity range needs to be constrained. Uh, mm -hmm. 
so uh, that's uh, that's one of the things uh, we will be focusing on yes thank you we have not done that yet but thank you thank you very much uh, you're okay thank you carolina thank you pepe other questions any other question for sabi in none we can finish here this seminar thank you very much uh, Saviachi, for this uh, talk and hope we can visit us and still collaborate with, uh, with the team here well, thank you thank you very much to rene and pepe carolina for the for the opportunity and to discuss and uh, as i said of course discussing gives you new uh, new ways to look at things as you said so as uh, it's always it's always good i mean